This is Thought in Motion, a series dedicated to the seminars of psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. Today's video covers lectures 8 to 11 in seminar 3. Lectures 8 through 11 further deepen our understanding of the psychoses through the registers of the imaginary, symbolic, and real. The previous few videos have vacillated between these registers as we've looked at this clinical structure from different vantage points. These lectures aim to bring the three registers together to form a more comprehensive and systematic examination of the psychoses. Lacan's conception of time and stages is an implicit theme running throughout these lectures and this is why I've decided to present them together in this video. A frequent difficulty in comprehending what's going on in Lacanian psychoanalysis is situated in a confusion around these notions. The ideas of memory, primordial signifiers, the narcissistic economy, repression, and refusal are intimately related to and understood in terms of a distinct conception of time and stages. And so in this video, we'll address the following questions. One. Why is repression best thought in terms of topology rather than chronology? Two, what is the symbolic sentence and how does it function in psychosis? And three, how does the primordial signifier function? Lacan begins Lecture 8 formulating psychosis in terms of a narcissistic economy and reminds his audience of how it moves through stages in Freud's own thought, beginning with the early notion of defense hysteria and its connection to the memory of trauma. Freud describes this hysteria as a means by which symptoms express a repressed discourse and must be freed. Such an analysis of memory disturbance and the role of repression shifts the event of trauma from a chronological fact to the topographical register wherein narcissism is to be discovered. The topographical model concerns a representation of mental structures that are dynamically interrelated. Though containing historical phenomena, these topographies are not themselves understood through history, but are instead a kind of structural representation of the present state of that history. What is important then is not whether some facts truly happened in the past or happened in the manner that they're being remembered as, but how memories, whether repressed or recalled, function within the present psychic economy. Returning to our consideration of the event of trauma, it induces modifications in the imaginary that interfere with the symbolic structuration of that imaginary. And the symbolic is, according to Lacan, where memory takes place. In neurosis, these interferences with the symbolic do not remove or disable the symbolic for the subject, who always remains in and structured by it. Rather, repression and the return of the repressed remain firmly within the symbolic register. The repressed is that which is not allowed to enter into ordinary, explicit discourse and instead reappears beneath a mask, though still within the symbolic. So the topographical location of repression and the topographical location of the return of the repressed are one and the same. Now in paranoia, by contrast, the repressed, if we can use this term for a moment despite not being entirely accurate, reappears without a mask through an imaginary reconstruction of the real. It's the ego that redirects this repressed desire, making the ego the center and cause of paranoia. However, as accurate as that might be, Lacan cautions us not to be satisfied with this explanation as Psychosis is not merely the formation of an imaginary relationship with the external world, but in addition we must also consider the ongoing role of language and the symbolic. Another critical element of psychosis is the phenomena of verbal alienation or verbal hallucination, which are experienced by the subject as coming from without. What is essential for Lacan is not their sensorial dimension, but how the patient reacts to them and how they become decisive for that subject. This leads Lacan back once again to a consideration of time, here concerning the distinction between the actual history of the subject's lived experience versus those decisive moments of symbolic articulation. 
As is the case with history more generally, there are many moments of historical events that are forgotten and lost forever. Nevertheless, what is of importance is what has been included, what's been given a meaning, whether it's accurate or not. For psychoanalysis, at least, historical accuracy gives way to the centrality of the selective retelling of history. It's the past as presently structured by the symbolic that matters. Now, the gap between the two, between reality and symbolic articulation, does allow for doubt to enter in. Yet, in psychosis, there's a fusion between the two whereby the selections are reality, giving rise to a kind of unreality or, as we'll later see, a restructuring of reality itself. As such, the decisive moments of symbolic articulation are not merely a matter of meaning subject to doubt, but places reality itself at stake. And this is what we have in the case of paranoia. And so this then leads us to the symbolic sentence, which Lacan seems to equate with what Freud called the unconscious thought, that is, the thing articulated in language. Lacan indicates that though this might be what we consider a kind of internal monologue, we shouldn't forget that it remains continuous with the external discourse of the other. The ego aims to avoid being poisoned by this sentence and facilitates a deafness to its articulation even though it nonetheless organizes our actions. With psychosis, the symbolic sentence, this discourse that seems to us as an internal monologue, is put out in the open, revealed in a highly articulated manner. And so this latent discourse of the symbolic sentence that forms the unconscious is not something the quote-unquote normal subject takes seriously, whereas in psychosis, the subject does take it very seriously. As Lacan states in Lecture 10, the psychotic is a martyr of the unconscious. And by this, he means martyr in the more etymological sense of being a witness, of giving an open testimony to it. Nonetheless, the psychotic is unable to share with others what is witnessed. What is being put into speech cannot be authentically integrated and situated within a shared discourse. Lacan then transitions to consider verbal hallucinations in terms of the relationship between mouth and ear. When we speak, someone else hears. Also, we hear ourselves when we speak. So what's going on here? To get our minds wrapped around this, Lacan has us imagine what it's like to hear a foreign language in which the understanding of the discourse becomes distinct from what is acoustically heard. The difference between expressions that are understood and those heard but not understood has to do with the anticipation of meaning. The discourse is located not only in the external speaker and their speech, but also in the listener. Listening and speaking are, in a sense, two sides of the same coin, and what joins them together to convey meaning is the signifier rather than the sensory phenomenon itself. So let's take up another situation that Lacan describes. Let's say we're heading toward dusk and find ourselves sitting outside on the porch as the sun sets with a thought coming to mind, the peace of the evening. Most of us can appreciate the meaning of this expression. It has a kind of presence and being for us. Yet, it's not exactly reducible to the sensorial experience of the physical transition of sun setting and darkness falling upon the earth. So Lacan asks us, what is the link between this expression and one's experience? There is a difference between the experience of having formulated the expression for the sake of uttering it versus having the expression take us by surprise or interrupt us. When it has the quality of surprising us, we experience it as barely belonging to us. It's an expression we're not entirely sure came from within or without. And the less it's expressed verbally, the more it speaks to us. To the degree we're not expecting it, it also presents itself as a signifier, but a signifier at the limit of discourse. And here we begin to find the signifier that's located in the real. These examples of the foreign discourse and the unbidden expression help us come to terms with the experience of Schreber. The connection between mouth and ear is frayed as meanings delivered by the ear take on a life of their own, independent of any system of articulated signifiers. 
And the signifiers now emerging from the subject are like those unbidden thoughts that lie at the limit of discourse now being encountered in the real. However, whereas the neurotic maintains a sense of doubt toward the origin of the signifier, the doubt whether it came from within or without, the psychotic subject will be certain of its location. And it's this certainty directed at this signifier that confers upon it a kind of power to stabilize the excess of meanings that are flowing out of the subject, giving rise to a well-organized delusion that supports Schreber's experience. Now what is this unconscious signifier that appears in the real, external to the subject? We begin to get an answer here in lecture 11. Importantly, Lacan presents us with one of the fundamental points for approaching the structure of psychosis, which is that the unconscious is present but not functioning. This comes to be expressed through the language phenomenon. Now, in a brief aside, Lacan does note that this examination of a phenomenon is distinct from what he calls the phenomenological point of view, which he says strives to discover what is contained in reality in itself. Lacan then states that he doesn't have this a priori confidence in the phenomenon, but rather proceeds with the fundamental starting point that the phenomenon is not to be trusted. And so we have to look for something more subsistent behind the phenomenon that explains it. So psychoanalysis is not merely a descriptive science, but an explanatory one. And it's the analysis of phenomena in terms of structure and psychic economy that distinguishes it from the field of phenomenology. Now, as someone who's involved in both fields, I'm tempted here to comment on this, comment on the relationship between phenomenology and psychoanalysis, something that is very much central to my own research. I'm gonna resist that temptation to stay on message, but did wanna note this for those who might be interested. In lecture 11, we briefly return to the ego and its function of relating to the external world, a function that has broken down. This ego, as we know by now and going through these seminars, is never alone, but always paired with the little other, who here Lacan identifies as the ideal ego, which if we recall from seminar one is distinct from the ego ideal and the superego. The ideal ego is described as the ego's twin who is big with delusion. What's notable is that this ideal ego speaks, making it a kind of phantasm, a ghost for, for the ego, rather than merely a fantasy of the ego. The discourse between the two takes place on the register of the real, but a discourse that has an unreal character to it, as it's a kind of fragmentary and delusional discourse. And this imaginary relation is what gives form to the prominence of alienation that we see in psychosis. But this explanation of alienation only accounts for its form and not for its origins. And so we have to turn to the symbolic and the phenomenon of language to be able to better appreciate it. Now Lacan emphasizes that the symbolic is always present from the very beginning of life. Even the notions of night and day, Lacan states, are signifying codes rather than lived experiences that mark the infant's daily cycles of wakefulness and sleep. There's a kind of primitive stage prior to the child learning to express language in which the world of signifiers makes its appearance. However, it's also the case that for the subject, these signifiers only become relevant, only take on a meaning later on. And so we return to the overarching theme of time and stages that I introduced at the beginning of this video. And so we must not try to understand this formulation of stages in a chronological sense, but a topographical one. As Lacan states, it's always by means of what follows that a text has to be understood. And so even though we talk about the primordial signifier, it's not something that you can pinpoint in the infant and then see its development. For this reason, the primordial signifier is nothing. It's a myth. There's no stage or moment in which the subject first acquires the primordial signifier leading to the play of meaning and the domain of discourse. Rather than a chronological or developmental fact, it is for Lacan a logical necessity that it be there. And its primordial character is more in the sense of a logical and structural antecedent rather than an empirical or historical one. So Lacan is inferring it from the fact that there is memory and there is the function of historicizing. 
for those to even take place, there had to be a primordial signifier. Yet it's not enough for it to be there. It's also the case the subject has to allow this primitive signifier to enter into one's history, to have it integrated within the larger signifying chain. And in doing so, it allows the subject to establish the most primordial dimension of the symbolic in its apprehension of reality through the judgment of existence. If the symbolic introduces the binary of presences and absences, this is done so, first of all, with the most fundamental category of all, that being existence. It's this primordial judgment that allows the subject to come to terms with the fact that reality is not a dream or a hallucination. And from there, the proper function of language takes hold, whereby words make present the lost object. Or as in the case of negation or verneinung, words have the power to make seemingly absent what is actually present. And so now with that, we have the beginnings of understanding the contrast between neurosis and psychosis. In psychosis, the primordial signifier is not denied but repudiated or foreclosed upon, reappearing instead in the real, giving rise to a kind of reworked reality or unreality. Lacan has yet to clearly develop what this means and what exactly the primordial signifier is in relation to the rest of the signifying system of the symbolic. What we know up to this point is that it's necessary for the subject in order to distinguish inside and outside, and it's necessary for structuring the imaginary. We can also figure out that it has something to do with the law and the big other, which are no longer integrated into the subject in psychosis, leading to a very different relationship to the symbolic as a whole. And this signifier, this voice of the law, is no longer a voice in one's own head, the voice of conscience, let's say, but a voice that appears out in the real. Now furthermore, the absence of the object that can only be made present by the signifier is no longer a fundamentally absent object. And so the subject is not fundamentally lacking either. Instead, the object remains present, but is deceptively being taken away by the little other, who seems to be embodying the law in an imaginary manner out there in the real. I want to thank the following for supporting this channel on Patreon. If you wish to support this work on Patreon, the link is below in the description. You can also support this work by liking and sharing this video and subscribing to my channel. By the time this video is uploaded, I will have reached a thousand subscribers, which is an amazing milestone. And there is a plan to do a more elaborate celebration of that and to talk about the journey, mostly for the sake of giving others a sense of what it might be like to, to do this with the theory channel. Uh, however, I, I still want to wait until I get the 4,000 hours as well. And I'm about 75% of the way there. And so hopefully that will be accomplished soon. And so keep an eye out for that video where we celebrate the uh, channel reaching this level. As always, thank you for watching. And until next time, be well.